This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Josh, welcome to the Human Action Podcast. Thank you for having me. Good. Thanks for the invite. Glad to be here. And uh, Dr. Murphy, people may not know, has been uh, a teacher of mine in uh, the Mises Graduate Program and also my thesis reader. So glad to be here with you again. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, Great stuff. Josh is a good student. (laughs) Before we dive into the festivities, though, folks, which is going to be going over a recent uh, article that Josh had on the Mises.org website, let me just mention to you a quick reminder. You don't want to miss the Mises Institute's annual Supporter Summit, which this year is being held in Hilton Head, South Carolina. It's going to be October 10th through 12th. I'm going to be giving a talk there along with Lou Rockwell, Tom Woods, Tom DiLorenzo, and many others. And the Institute will also be premiering its new Federal Reserve documentary. Mises members can get their tickets now at Mises.org slash SS24. So that's for Supporter Summit 24, Mises.org slash SS24 if you're a member. Okay, Josh, so your article had the provocative title. So, so folks, of course, we'll put a link to this, but in case you're just trying to find it, Again, uh, this was September 9th, 2024 by Josh Mahorter. Governments had a major role in sustaining slavery. Now, this is interesting because one of the chief complaints that um, certain leftist progressive types in at least the United States will level against capitalism is, oh, it's inextricably linked with the institution of slavery. And to them, like, isn't that just the embodiment of it, right? That under even just, quote, normal capitalism, that these right-wing Republican conservative libertarian types like to defend. There's a f- form of, you know, wage slavery, you might call it, where the workers just get, you know, their commodities and treat as such. But back in the day, like, workers were literally treated as commodities, and that's kind of just, you know, capitalism in its rawest form. And so I'm guessing you disagree with that, but perhaps more generally, too, can you just explain, like, what made you write on this subject before we go into the particulars? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bill Anderson helped me uh, choose a title. I, I originally titled this, I think, the the state's role in uh, in slavery, but I think his title is a good one. Um, and I, of course, don't find it very provocative, but you know, sometimes things are more con- uh, controversial, uh, I guess, than they seem. Um, but yeah, as you point out, like a lot of times, people assume that, uh, like you said, capitalism and slavery are inextricably linked on the, you know, on the market, you can buy and sell people, you know, um, and that that's free market, uh, capitalism. And I think that's kind of the, uh, more the leftist side is that, well, the, that, um, capitalism is bad. Slavery is bad. Let's, they must be connected, uh, together. And, uh, and then they'll take for, through that, uh, further. And then they'll extrapolate and say, um, America's wealth is actually dependent on slavery. So it's, it's ill gotten. And I, I know you've, uh, written, uh, on this and referenced a lot of things that were helpful for me in studying this topic before that all of our wealth is actually, um, in modern America is thanks to, thanks to slavery, um, and the production that happened through slavery. Um, so I, I will say at the beginning that uh, no free market capitalism uh, and I uh, and you uh, reject slavery because we affirm self ownership, we affirm property rights. So you cannot um, kidnap someone. Um, I affirm the biblical teaching against kidnapping and man stealing. Um, and and say that the free market is um, is against that. And I, if in fact, think that um, slavery and enslaving people and forcing someone to work against their will, that God has built into the world economic laws that actually make that less productive. So that when we don't cooperate, it it's uh, harder uh, on us. It's a dead weight loss. So why I wanted to write about this is. Um, for a number of years, I've been a, a teacher, um, also studier of uh, economics uh, and politics. And in teaching American history, I wanted to help students and myself think through uh, think through the topic uh, 
And, you know, we all know that there's the 13th Amendment, which ends slavery except for punishment of a crime. And I've had discussions with colleagues that said, well, yeah, unless you had the uh, the government come in and fight a civil war uh, and you know, bring slavery to an end through through violence and then uh, the legislation of the, the 13th Amendment type of thing, you wouldn't have slavery come to an end. But what I kept seeing um, was an area that I, I thought was a little bit underdeveloped. Um, and I found a lot of writing on this that's been uh, been very good, but that slavery was very subsidized. The costs were very socialized. The, the slaveholding elite teamed up with the state in a cronyistic way to socialize the costs onto non-slaveholders and privatize the gains onto themselves so that the system ultimately cost everybody except the few who were benefiting from it through the, the subsidies, regulations, and uh, socialism of, uh, of the cost through the state. Um, and, and what started actually getting me down this road was even just the idea of um, restrictions of, of manumission, meaning if somebody legally wanted to free their slaves, there were laws against that, uh, that, that didn't, uh, and regulations of steps that you had to go through um, that made it difficult to free slaves. And I said, well, that's interesting. I wonder if Murray Rothbard in his Conceived in Liberty talks about this. And he does, but it's an area where I, I was thinking, oh, I wish he had gone on and said uh, so much more about this because his insights there uh, would have been helpful. So to make a short story long, uh, <laughs> that was to, uh, the, my purpose was um, to, to help teach myself and others through the topic and see that uh, my main argument is that without big government and regulation at the federal and state level, slavery could not have grown and expanded to what it was. And there would have been natural pressures uh, from, from the free market competition that would have, if it didn't get rid of slavery, it would have made it much uh, less in its scope and extent. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's a great summary of the, you know, the big picture of this. And then, like I say, we'll go through and hit some of those topics, including the, the manumission one. That, yeah, I think that's the key one of, of the things you talked about, which are real, that gets to the essence of what we're talking about here. Um, but yeah, just to sort of underscore two of the points you made there that I've noticed that in talking, you know, the way Americans talk about slavery, they take it as a given that, oh, yes, the only way to get rid of slavery clearly is you have to have a civil war and hundreds of thousands of people have to die, but it's a price worth paying. And they seem not to ever either they don't know or they don't think about, well, you know, it's not like plantation slavery in the United States was when this institution was invented in human history. Right. You know, there are countries and cultures around the world had slavery for thousands of years. And typically it doesn't take a humongous war with hundreds of thousands of people dying in order for slavery. You know, the British empire had slavery. They didn't have a huge bloody war to get rid of it. Right. 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 So, so there's that element, but then also, as you say, I think the way some people view it as is that, Oh, yep, this system of property rights and, you know, buying and selling and everything's all commodities and so forth with no concern about justice. That's, you know, profit seeking and whatnot, that sort of acquisitive behavior. Mm -hmm. That's free market capitalism. It had slaves being bought and sold at auction, just like you would expect from these greedy, you know, either immoral or amoral capitalists. And then it took government intervention to come in and stamp that out, just like you know, it took government intervention to protect unions and to give us the weekend and da, 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 and to have safety standards. And so in general, how can you right wing ideologue nut jobs not want government to regulate business when can't you see? Yeah, we, we would have children working in factories and dying, you know, every other day and we'd have poisonous food and we would actually have literal slavery were it not for the government to come in and just say, no, some things you're not allowed to do in the quote free market. Sorry, we don't have a free market because the free market gives you child labor and, labor and slavery. Right. So that's, yeah, so given that, that's why I think, you know, your analysis is so useful is to show, you know, that you're pushing back. At, no, the reason slavery persisted so long was precisely because of government intervention and not because they didn't intervene the right noble way. Like, oh, if we just had elected the right people, then they would have fixed it. Okay, um, so maybe... 
probably what we'll, we'll do here. Well, let me just read this. Uh, you've got this quote from Patrick Newman. Yes. Uh, so he's got this book, Cronyism, Liberty Versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849. And so I'll read this and just let you, you know, discuss it. So this is Patrick Newman, uh, you know, an another uh, fellow with the Mises Institute. Significantly, planters also augmented the business of corrupt African chieftains involved in the slave trade. The labor system required a panoply of subsidies to stop escaping and revolting slaves. Among others, the colonies conscripted patrols to catch runaways and put down rebellions, regulated slave meetings and travels, requir required the return of fugitive slaves, and restricted voluntary manumissions. England assisted by incorporating the Royal African Company with a monopoly over African land in the slave trade. Colonial feudalism, from the land grants to the coerced workforce, embodied cronyism. So what's going on in that quote, and you know, why did you include that? Well, I, let me just say I'm so uh, grateful for uh, Dr. Newman's um, book on this because, and the, his new one is coming out, so it's featured right now um, as, a, as a page on uh, Mises.org. Uh, so uh, he goes forward uh, through history because I think he does in kind of a Rothbardian way. He goes through and um, and, and provides a little bit more detail and I think more uh, more footnotes than Rothbard did in like a book like Conceived in Liberty. Um, but what he's writing about here, I think his his view is that cronyism, which is uh, an important concept that uh, just to find, you know, for, I know a lot of people watching understand this, but for those who may not, cronyism is the idea that there's not usually just pure free market or uh, pure socialist statism, but somewhere in the middle where, where the private and public sector team up to use the, the power apparatus of the state to not for the good of the people, but for at the expense of the people and the taxpayer to benefit these, uh, these powerful private interests who have, uh, lobbied and participated, um, with the government, uh, to get laws passed and regulations passed on their behalf, uh, to benefit them. And so what, uh, Dr. Newman talks about here is, uh, the ways that, uh, the slaveholding elite uh, accomplished this, um, both in somewhat in England, uh, but also in, uh, in America, that they had to get the government on their side to enforce the cost, uh, to, to transfer the enforcement costs of slavery onto non-slaveholders. If, if my article can be summed up in a sentence, it's that, that slaveholding elites use the government and the apparatus to take the costs of slavery from them and place it onto non-slaveholders and the slaves themselves, obviously, so that they could uh, profit and benefit from slavery. So I thought this sentence was so good because it talked about the, the powers participating in slavery. And then I highlighted his sentence, the labor system required a panoply of subsidies uh, to stop escaping and revolting slaves. Now, if you just had slavery, which has always existed from human cultures, uh, in all human cultures throughout human history, that has existed, but you have to either watch them or pay someone to watch them. And then when they run away, you have to chase them or pay someone to chase them. Well, it's kind of hard to get someone to do that. And it's costly to do those things. So, that already puts kind of a delimitation on how much slavery can expand. So what they they did was got subsidies and regulations from the government to have other people chase down their slaves uh, that were legally required to to do that. Um, and so uh, he also mentioned here, uh, which I'd be interested to look into, but England and the royal uh, giving a monopoly to the Royal African Company um, for. Uh, participating in the slave uh, trade. So there's this one company given a government monopoly to uh, benefit from uh, the slave trade. But yeah, basically uh, what he, he encapsulates here is the idea of uh, transferring costs and onto others while uh, reaping the benefits for themselves through the government. Yeah, and this is a great uh, distinction you're making there. And maybe just if we can unpack it a little bit, because this is so relevant too to the modern day 
debate in the United States over reparations for slavery. And one of my, you know, chief objections to that, I mean, there's all kinds of objections you could raise that I'm sure the listeners, you know, are familiar with them. But one that people don't often say that I would say is, no, it doesn't make sense to, so yes, slavery made, you know, the black slaves poorer, you know, that imposed harms on them. And I understand why you might want to just or, or compensate them now, but it also made the average white person in the United States poorer than he otherwise would have been. And so it, it's not that it took from, you know, the slaves and gave to everybody, to the non-slaves, and it was a net transfer that way. And therefore nowadays the descendants of the non-slaves should pay the descendants of the slave. And, and the re and so that seems hard to square. Like, well, if it, what are you talking about? I'm saying, no, it, the, as an institution, slavery is very inefficient and unproductive. And so right. a society, like that's why I say among, you know, how come this in the US Civil War, the South didn't send its Navy to blockade the North and to starve out the people in New York and whatever, you know, and, mm -hmm. and how come the South didn't send its armies up and start, you know, burning down whatever, New York and, and so forth. And the, the reason is because the North was a lot richer and had a bigger yeah. population. And, and I say, that's not a coincidence. It's partly because they had free labor, right? So, I mean, there's other Absolutely. historical factors too. So, um, but then again, but to, you know, to get to your point, this is, okay, well, if it's so inefficient, then why did they do it at all? Like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. You know, you, you got some people, they're doing work, and if you don't pay them, you know, a market wage, but you instead just pay them, you know, the bare subsistence amount so they don't physically die, clearly you're profiting from that. What, what are you talking about, Murphy? And so that's, you know, getting the heart of what you're talking about, that y y there are, yeah, so we're, we're not merely talking about the cost to the slaves. Like, yeah, you'd want to be right. free, and if you produce you know, $100 worth of output for a given period in a, in a market, you would get paid, you know, close to 100. But the slave, you know, under slavery, you only get paid, you know, the $20 subsistence to keep you alive. Yep, that's an $80 boon to the to the owner. But they also have to have, you know, a surveillance system, they have to pay people to watch them, and they have to have chains and stuff like right. And that that's a cost that yep. you don't need when it's voluntary. And then also too the slaves don't work as hard and the types of output, you know what I mean? Like to have some people doing whatever, picking cotton to use the, you know, the, the prototypical example. Okay. But there's probably a lot of people there that they could have done something better, more productive, you know, contributing more to output, but, and that other type of thing that wouldn't have been conducive to having a slave do that. You would have needed a free person to do that. Right. So there's lots of stuff like that. And it's not purely, the slaves who lose out if they're not using their labor in the most productive way possible. It's like, you know what I mean? Like you benefit from somebody entering the economy, even if he's getting paid his marginal product, it's not that it's a wash. And so like if, if you know, if the top 1% of income earners in the U S just disappeared tomorrow, it's not that it would be a complete wash because, Oh, anything they produced, they just would have been paid, you know, with competitive labor markets. And so therefore like, like Krugman one time was arguing that. I don't know if that was on your radar, John. And he just was like, whoa, you just don't even understand basic stuff here. So sure. anyway, that's, uh, so I'll, I'll stop with that trade. Do you have any oh, thoughts on yeah, that before um, we? Yeah, I mentioned a lot of great things there. I actually have another article uh, coming out on Monday called Understanding the Real Costs of Slavery. Slavery, it's not cheap labor. And my point is, I actually start there uh, using the work of Mises uh, and a kind of building from what we would call a Crusoe economy of one person and I, on an island. And I say, okay, well, let's say one person meets an ox on an island and he wants to, you know, uh, tame and train the ox to plow a field. Okay, well, now let's add two people on the island. And instead of pos uh, positively... Uh, cooperating with this person um, voluntarily, this person tries to uh, enslave the person. You could do that, but there are tremendous costs to, to doing that, that put downward pressure, negative pressures on slavery um, in general. So if, if we're on an island and I try to uh, enslave you, uh, rather than, you know, trade with you or, or leave you alone or, or whatever we decide to do, I, I would have to uh, try to overpower you, try to get you to work for me to produce more than the cost of my enforcing slavery against you. And then, like you said, you wouldn't work as hard. So it's not even really, in a sense, 
going to be ultimately probably worth it to me just because I'm not paying you. But then I also look uh, in this Monday article into the um, the average costs of slaves in 1850. There's some articles and some books that uh, that reference these things. And uh, it uh, versus uh, the cheapest free labor in the world, meaning voluntary labor in the world, uh, which was in, in India at that time. And the average cost of a slave, uh, rental uh, of slave plus insurance plus enforcement costs uh, is estimated to be somewhere around 100 and I believe $68. And then you had to add $30 on that per year for insurance. But the average cost of a the cheapest uh, day labor in India at that time that the British were employing at very low wages was was cheaper to employ than paying uh, for slave labor. So it's actually um, it's actually not cheap labor. Uh, slavery has a tremendous cost to it, and there's some uh, great uh, works on this. Um, namely, there's uh, Jeffrey Rogers Hummel wrote. Uh, a book dissertation um, called uh, Sl- a Civil War, or it's called the, the Dead Weight Loss of Slavery, which is um, available online. And then the other thing I want to say is just regarding the, um, the reparations uh, discussion that, that goes on today is if you reject the idea of self-ownership and property rights that are fundamental to a free market, then you don't really get to claim that something is stolen in past slavery through and, and has to be repaid through reparations. Now, I do think there is a just uh, reparation, which is the, the forced return of stolen property. Um, so if somebody's still possessing property that was um, owned by someone uh, in the past and they can demonstrate that and, and prove that uh, to the case and then work out some type of, okay, well, this is what it's worth then and here's what you should be paid. Sure, there should be an exchange uh, relative to that, but there's uh, a presumption of innocence and a burden of proof that would have to be on the person claiming that, you know, that you still hold property or something that uh, that you owe to them. So um, since possession's nine-tenths of the law, somebody claiming that um, that you had slave owners in your history in the past who owned my ancestors in the past, um, therefore you owe me X amount of dollars. Well, that would you'd have to still hold, I think, the property in question uh, to be able to justly transfer it to somebody. If your family doesn't uh, still own that land or property. There's no, um, there's no transfer that can can take place. Um, and the other flaw in the the modern um, reparations argument is uh, basically this: slavery involved treating non criminal people as criminals. The modern reparation theory also wants to treat modern non-criminal people as criminals. It, it wants to hold people responsible who have not committed the crime of slavery responsible for slavery, similarly to the same logic where slaves were, who were non-criminal people were uh, treated as criminals by being kidnapped. So the logic uh, that justified slavery also is the same logic that justifies um, I would call a modern or leftist uh, reparations for people who don't believe in in property anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so right, if you don't right. have if you don't have property, you can't have stolen property. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's the problem. Is where we ask them, we say, "Look, you can. You're right to be upset about slavery, but you need to join us on the the validity and ethics of uh, property rights, not." Uh, say there are no such things as property rights, and now we're going to do do uh, wealth transfers via the government. Yeah, just at, at the risk of beating a dead horse here, just to underscore why you know Josh and I are spending so much time in this and why it is controversial is what I noticed, Josh, is when I this is years ago at this point when I started writing on this and I was getting pushback, and I found myself in this weird position where I was saying slavery is inefficient economically, and there were like black 
academics who were arguing, no, slavery was very efficient. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And it was just funny. And I realized like why, you know, it's, there was a weird perverse sense in which I was almost more anti-slavery than they were on certain dimensions. And, and I, you know, and, and the reason though, because they, for their case to go through, it has to be the case that slavery, you know, the U S as of 1900, mo much of its wealth was a direct result of slavery. And so if I was right in terms of my economics saying, no, the U S as of 1900 would have been far wealthier per capita, whatever, you know, on average, than uh, it, it had slavery never existed. Right. right. So, and, and, and that's again, so it's hard to compare. And the, the analogy I use is to say like something like war, like a standard, you know, traditional anti-war leftist can understand. Yes. War is good for big business, you know, Lockheed Martin and whatever big defense contracts, that's good for a small group of people, but clearly the people at large are worse off because of wars, especially right. if they're frivolous right. ones. Wouldn't we be better off if there were no Nazis in the first place versus fighting World War II? I, I held up this book because this is the main book that's uh, the culprit in this. And mm. it, it, it's, an, it's a good study in a lot of ways, the the uh, Fogel and Engerman uh, time on the cross. But even um, better than the book itself is uh, Dr. Thornton's analysis. He wrote a paper called Slavery profitability and the market process. And he, he identified exactly what you're talking about. And so does um, Jeffrey Rogers Hummel, that slavery was, uh, they, they make the argument that, yeah, slavery was extremely profitable. But the point we're making is, yes, it was profitable for a few because they could transfer the costs onto non-slaveholders via the state. But it was a deadweight cost to everybody else, especially the slaves, but every non-slaveholder in America and America as a whole, where we would have been much wealthier had we not had the tragedy of slavery in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so like I said, that's why I believe God works through these laws of cooperation and, and peaceful agreement uh, that produces the, the net effect of wealth rather than uh, conflict and slavery, where you, we think we're getting something for nothing by doing those things, but really it, um, it impoverishes uh, an economy. Okay, let's, if, I think Josh probably makes sense at this point. Let's just start going through. So you have four main topics here that you unpack in your, in your article. So why don't we just go through those in turn? So the first one is slave patrols. And you had this nice quote, uh, This is so this is first Josh talking, and then I'll go into the quote he had. According to pro-slavery theorist George Fitzhugh, these conscripted patrollers were essential to the integrity of the maintenance of the slave system. Quote, the poor constitute our militia and our police. They protect men in possession of property, as in other countries, and do much more. They secure men in possession of a kind of property, slaves, which they could not hold a day but for the supervision and protection of the poor. All right, so it was an interesting thing where he's, it almost looks like he's like, like yeah, we're grateful for the poor. Like, look at the service they're providing. Not only do they go to war and defend us from foreign invasion, put their lives on the line to protect the community, but here you've got poor people who, if a slave runs away, these poor people go hunt the slave down and bring it back, not because it redounds to their financial benefits, since they don't own slaves, they're poor people, but to, you know, the rich landed uh, gentry. And hey, that's that's kind of a neat system. And we're all it's all we're all in this together. That's kind of what he's. Right. Yeah. Um, and I have to give credit to, uh, again, Jeffrey Rogers Hummel, uh, Jeffrey Rogers Hummel. Um, I got this quote. It was either from his Emancipating Slaves and Enslaving Free Men, which is a great, uh, very detailed, very footnoted book on the Civil War. Um, or his uh, writings on the deadweight cost of slavery. He also, if you just Google his name with slavery, he has a whole essay of identifying all kinds of um, great resources to, to study this topic. But yeah, this is what you were talking about before, where you were starting to sound, you're like, why am I sounding more anti-slavery than black academics? I think you wrote an article some time ago where it's like, why are, why are leftist academics arguing that slavery was awesome, like very profitable. They're arguing just like the Southern fire eaters who were saying slavery is not just a thing we kind of apologize for, but don't know how to deal with, like Thomas Jefferson types said. They said, no, slavery is great. You know, this is, this is the best system 
And um, it like and the backbone of our society, and it benefits not just the slaveholders, but people at large. Right. Yeah. This yeah. is a system that benefits everyone. But this quote, uh, George Fitzhugh is writing, I believe, in the 1850s. So this is right as the Civil War is, is heating up, and he's writing this pamphlet. Uh, where he's trying to say, look, slavery is benefiting everyone in our society. But this is where he draws in is on this, this slave patrol thing. As he says, look, what about most of the Southern white free farmers don't own slaves? Well, but they also contribute to the system because they go catch our slaves. But they don't do that for free. I mean, meaning they don't get, they don't get reap a net benefit from it, but men were actually, uh, legally conscripted. So imagine this, imagine you are a poorer, free white Southerner who is not a slave owner in the South. Slavery is, you know, pushing down, uh, your wages, arguably, and you're trying to compete with these massive, you know, uh, socialized, uh, plantations. But part of your job during the year is the government says, hey, by the way, you need to go catch a bunch of um, rich people's slaves. Well, and you need to break up their gatherings. You need to monitor their passes. Oh, and if you don't do that, you're going to get fined. Uh, you're going to maybe get prison time uh, for for not following this law. So either you need to do it or you need to find someone to do it in your place. Now, for you to go do that, you have to give up time, money, energy, resources, even if you, you, maybe you don't even give up money, you have to go give up time to go catch someone else's slaves, right? When slavery is not benefiting you at all. And so this is a, a perfect example of how the slaveholding elite used the government to force non-slaveholders to pay the costs of slavery. So the slaveholding elite gets people to catch the slaves for them do, and do their dirty work, uh, basically, that they're not brave enough to or you know, willing to pay the costs of themselves. They get to reap the benefits from not paying the slaves and getting their labor. And then they get to have people and take on the uh, the enforcement costs. And so really, this is a, um, a tax on their, uh, on their labor, their productive capacity, when, when these people could have been doing something else. Um, and this a benefit only accrues uh, to the slaveholding elite, and it's only made possible by, um, by these laws. Take away these laws... And if you don't have people to catch your slaves for you, well, then you have to pay or catch someone, catch them yourselves. And that makes slavery much more costly and something that's much more costly, you know, there people do less of it. Right. Just, just to make an analogy here, just to, to um, turn down the dial on, you know, because human slavery is obviously such a, you know, emotional thing. But like if there was a, a big cattle rancher and then there were a bunch of small independent farmers who lived near them. And any time, you know, the, the ranchers, animals got loose and went, the government went around to the, lo the little individual farmers and said, come on, guys, let's go. You got to go catch, you know, Moe's cattle and bring them back to him. And he was kind of, in a sense, your competitor. And they weren't being paid for that. And in fact, it was like, no, if, if you say no, then you're going to be in trouble legally. Say what you will about that. But clearly that wouldn't be free market capitalism. Right. Right. And so you couldn't possibly like point to that and say, oh, yeah, that's unregulated laissez-faire. You'd say, no, that's explicit government intervention picking winners and losers. Right. Absolutely. So that's, yeah, again, you could call it, you could say the attempt to start out with a market economy inevitably leads to that, you know, and cronyism or whatever. Okay, fine. But it's clearly not unregulated laissez-faire capitalism. So likewise here too, that slavery, you know, to the extent that relied on these uh, coercive slave patrols, that's not showing how great slavery is in terms of the profit and loss statement if we don't have moralist politicians regulating it. No, you got moralist politicians saying slavery is essential for our way of life, and that's why we're going to socialize the costs, as, as you've been saying. Okay, uh, what about fugitive slave laws? I'll just read a little bit from your thing. A second way governments enforced the subsidization of slavery by the non-slaveholders was through fugitive slave laws. This example is even seen in the Constitution itself. In fact, it was a chief issue in the growing sectional conflict that led to the Civil War. 
Uh, and so then Patrick Newman, again, in his book, Cronyism, said, quote, Slavery survived not because of technological advancements related to agriculture, but because of the nationalizing constitution and its fugitive slave clause, along with the 1793 Fugitive Slave Act, that socialized enforcement costs and made it harder for slaves to escape. State regulations buttressed the fugitive slave clause, most notably mandatory slave patrols composed of poor white men. So similar kind of thing, but now we're just extending it to the northern <clears throat> regions where slavery was was actually not a legal thing. So can you just expand on that? Especially for people who don't like what was the Fugitive Slave Act? Like what, what is yes. it even talking about? So there are a few Fugitive Slave Acts. One is in the, the Constitution itself. Uh, there's another, uh, there's a couple of them. Another one is uh, a cause of uh, the immediate cause or approximate cause of the Civil War is, a, is in 1850. It uh, gives a, a stronger fug federal fugitive slave law. Um, and then also uh, the famous Dred Scott case in 1857 uh, plays into this as well. Um, a fugitive slave, I often explain this to my, my students, is, uh, is uh, you have a free state and a slave state right next to each other. Okay. A fugitive slave steps from where slavery is legal to where slavery is illegal. And absent a fugitive slave law, an escaped slave law, that slave is now home free. They they have stepped into a region where slavery is no longer legal. And so a lot of states had, to their credit, gotten rid of slavery. And that was that was great. That being said, if they were going to join together some of the slaveholding elites who were in play during the discussion of the Constitution, talked about, okay, but we've got to deal with this situation. And so what the fugitive slave law said, and I would normally do this in my classroom, I would bring up um, students and draw a line down the, the classroom or make an imaginary line. And I'd say, okay, pretend you're a slave in a slave state. Here's a free state next door. And now you, what would you want to do? And they cross the line. I say, okay, but with a fugitive slave law, the federal government of the United States now says, free state, we know you've said slavery is illegal, but we're going to make you take those slaves that come from a slave state and return them to a, a free, uh, the, the slave state, wherever they came from. In effect, it's the the way I summarize it is it was getting the free states to enforce slavery in the slave states because and and transferring the costs. So basically, free states, you may not have slavery, but the government says you're going to enforce it be, and you're going to help us enforce it. And you're going to pay the costs of, of enforcing it for us. So this is actually um, one of the unappreciated or underappreciated areas of states' rights in the Civil War era leading up to the Civil War is that the federal government uh, was, was forcing on free states the subsidization that's can't say the word subsidization and enforcement of slavery. And this is what the Dred Scott case uh, was about, is it said Dred Scott's, you know, uh, slave holder took him into a free state, died, left him there. He said, I'm, I'm free now. Well, they said this, we know in the Missouri court said, yes, you're right, gets pulled up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, OK, now we're stuck because the Supreme Court says property is protected, life, liberty, property are protected in all states slave property's property, and therefore now we have to say that slavery is valid, prop uh, slave property is valid property in every single state. And, and so they, the, uh, the Supreme Court affirms that, uh, that, this, is, uh, that this is the case in, in a terrible uh, decision where this is, uh, where the idea of um, ownership of human beings comes to a fore that it, you can't you can't own human beings then also have protection of property unless you're going to uh, 
uh, have the protection of slave property. And so um, so that's what the, the fugitive slave laws brought about. Um, and one of the reasons that the southern states uh, seceded was because a lot of states said, we're not doing this. We're not enforcing this. And we're not allowing people to come into our states and kidnap people and, and take them back. Um, and so this is why states like South Carolina started getting upset. They said, we're seceding because other states are nullifying the, the 1850 fugitive slave law. And so um, this brought about, uh, ironically, this, uh, so the states' rights thing is not just a Southern uh, argument. It's actually a Northern argument as well. Uh, but basically, yes, this, uh, the fugitive slave laws uh, caused free states to enforce slavery. And my main argument with this is you don't have fugitive slave laws. Slavery becomes much more costly to enforce which is what happened in Brazil that had a slave section and a free section and slavery collapsed on its own because of the, uh, the, uh, it wasn't worth it to enforce it anymore. Too many slaves were escaping, um, to the free section and the government finally said, okay, we're done. We're not going to, we're not going to enforce slavery anymore. It's not even, uh, not even worth it to try. And so that could have been the case in a counterfactual. Of course, we don't know. Uh, in the United States. But what is guaranteed is that without the fugitive slave law, you would have had uh, uh, more people escaping to freedom and uh, costs would have been increased on slavery. Yeah, the uh, for people who saw the old interview with a zombie thing that I did with Tom Woods, in, in case you didn't realize the zombie was me, um, <laughs> that, that was part of it, right? That he was you know, saying that people, when people hear the word nullification, it was for his book, Nullification. When people hear that, they just routinely, they have been trained to, if they even have heard of it ever, think that, oh yeah, it's like what Southern states nullify, you know, throwing out things or like if some, some white lynch mob lynches a guy because they think he whistled at a white woman or something and the jury nullifies or like, that's what people think it means. And he was saying, but historically, actually it was often used, as you say, Northern states saying, I don't care what the federal government says. I, no, we're not, we're not going to return these, these runaways. We think that they're, you know, free human beings and so forth. Um, and, and so again, just to tie this back into the main point here, or one of the main points for people who think, oh yes, yeah, slavery is this natural, you know, quote, natural outgrowth of a free market capitalist market economy. And it took the federal government rolling up its sleeves and, and battling the forces of capitalism to liberate the slaves. That no, far from that, you know, to say not only was it that we you didn't need the government to do that, all it would have taken was the, the government, the federal government to stop forcing non-slave states to subsidize the slave states, right? They could have just remained neutral on the topic, and that would have been better than what they were doing in the 1850s, right? right. So to understand, you know, the persistence of this. Okay, so we're I'm just looking at the clock here. So let's accelerate because I still want to, sure. you got to hit two more and then I want to get the, the takeaway. So the manumission restrictions, um, let's see, let me just read this. The online Encyclopedia Britannica states that, man, this is you talking, Josh, states that manumission was, the word manumission, folks, means when the owner of a slave, you know, of his own accord frees them. That's what the term means. The online Encyclopedia Britannica states that manumission was comparatively difficult in the American South. Manumission was even forbidden in South Carolina in 1820, Mississippi 1822, Arkansas 1858, and Maryland and Alabama in 1860. Another online encyclopedia similarly explains, quote, on the eve of the revolution, voluntary manumission was illegal in most of the South, and even where it was permitted, the practice was not common. Okay, and so here I'll just make one more editorial remark and let you rip here, Josh. So to me, this is the smoking gun if you're trying to argue with somebody who's claiming that slavery as it existed and persisted in the South kind of showed that's capitalism for you, that no, clearly what we mean by capitalism is the almost dogmatic enforcement of property rights. And so if you're saying this horrifying system of slavery where one person can own another and this person is that person, is the first person's property, right? So if it's your property, you can do what you want with it, right? And the government can't tell you what to do with your property. Isn't that what unregulated? And yet here we have partly what propped up slavery for so long was the government told slave owners, you are not allowed to sell 
to, to, to donate your property titles to some people who happen to be slaves. In other words, to say to a given slave, right now the loss is I own you, but since I have controlled my property, I'm going to give this property title. You know, I could sell you to a different plantation owner, or I could sell you to you, and I'll charge zero dollars. There you go. That's what it means to say I just freed you. And the government said you cannot do that. You do not have the right to do that with your property, what you want in certain circumstances. So that is clearly government regulation of people's property rights. And I would say clearly the point of it was to uphold the institution of slavery. Yeah, absolutely. And this is, I think, one of the more, why I'm quoting from uh, encyclopedias of, you know, and stuff is because I think this is one of the understudied areas that, that could use some more um, work on if anybody's interested. I'm, I'm looking into this a little bit more myself. Um, and Rothbard references it, but doesn't talk, uh, go into detail and conceived in liberty. But yeah, basically, um, we all know how it is to deal with the DMV, to get a license, to pay a fee, to do all this stuff. Basically, there were people that freed their slaves through manumission. George Washington uh, had in his will that after Martha Washington died, their slaves would be free. But you had to get the government's permission. And even just that step, having to get permission, you often had to pay a fee. And I believe in Virginia, you had to prove to a, a council of um, the Virginia government that the slave had performed some um, uh, meritorious act, like saving your life or something, and that they were worth uh, freeing. So just even the, the regulations and steps to doing that made it harder for people to free their own slaves. Now, I know a lot of people would say, and even this uh, article that I, that I cited here, said it wasn't common, not that many people did it. But that reminded me of a statement from the late um, economist Walter Williams, who he talks about um, things like segregation laws. And he says, look, remember, segregation laws were laws. Mm -hmm. the, they, yes, they were a result of a racist society, this or that, but they were laws. If you take the segregation laws away, you have to assume that people are going to integrate in ways that the segregation laws forbid. Otherwise, there's no point in the laws. And so the manumission restrictions, meaning government tells you you have to get its permission to free your slaves, means that uh, you have to go through this, this process that would be more difficult to free them uh, than just if you wanted to free them. So for people who say, well, people just didn't want to, well, then why did they need the laws if that was the case? More slaves would have been freed otherwise uh, without these manumission laws uh, had they not existed than, uh, than would have been the case if they did exist because otherwise you wouldn't need them in the first place. Um, so I'd have to do a little bit more looking into this. But one of the um, uh, things, a uh, primary source that's interesting about this time that I – I don't remember if he was in America at this time, but there's a, a book called uh, The Interesting Narrative of Alado Equiano, um, who was a slave uh, who was captured from Africa, uh, taken over in the Middle Passage. And he uh, became a Christian believer uh, and wrote his own autobiography. So it's a very um, rare type of book we have. Um, one of the greatest sections in that book uh, besides, uh, I think, chapter 10, he talks about his uh, conversion and salvation, but also is, is his, uh, he had raised enough money and agreed with his master to manumit him. But one of the section of the book is him going through all the steps to get the money, get his master's permission, get a document signed, go down to the government office, get it notarized, pay the fee, you know, all this stuff. And I'm like, Gosh, that seems like a pain, you know, to that if the costs were reduced of doing that, maybe people who were willing to free their slaves would have freed them more. Yeah. And uh, just to drive home this point, because, again, folks, if if Josh and I are right in that as an institution, slavery is actually very inefficient. What that means is if it's persisting, there must be, you know, win win gains from trade if just you could come up with the right way to, you know, to allocate it and to, to lead to freedom. So I'm just making this up as an example, but uh, I've often thought, okay, so you, you know, you're a, a, sl a slave owner, 
and you got a hundred people, you know, on your property that are you know, living out in the cabins or whatnot. And you know that some of them are actually a lot more productive. Like if you just think about it, and I, I, I realize folks, this is going to be, make some of you squeamish here, but that, you know, we got to talk about this and be real that, okay, so you, you get them, there's got to be punishment involved. Otherwise, why would they do anything? Right. And so you say, okay, but how uh, you, when you're informing, you know, your foreman or whatever the title would be of these people, the guys going around enforcing the quotas or whatnot, like, what do you got to do to avoid getting whipped or otherwise punished? You know, they could have rough rules of thumb, like, okay, yeah, like an adult man we're expecting is going to pick more than, you know, some little, you know, eight-year-old girl or something, F fair enough, or somebody's really sick or somebody, you know, a woman who's pregnant, clearly, you know, you're not going to expect as much out, out of her. But still, whatever rules you pick, there's going to be some people that it, they have the ability, they could pick more. And they're just going right. not to, because why would they? It just goes to, you know, the man, like just, they do the bare minimum to avoid. And so you could imagine, you know, someone coming out and you as an owner saying things like, okay, so here's the, you know, the basic structure, you know, you got to pick this amount, you know, given your characteristics to avoid a beating or whatever it is, or to, to not get your food slashed. Um, but if you pick this amount, you know, we'll let you keep that. And then eventually, if you want to over time, you know, like you, in a sense, you can save up in an account, you know, with us here at the house. And eventually if you hit this target, you know, you can buy your freedom from us. And now you can say, yeah, yeah, that's not fair. They shouldn't have to do that. I agree. It's a horrifying system, but I'm just, my point is slavery is so inefficient that whatever the rules were, if they just locked that in with the property rights and they were secure, then they would do like what's called cozy and side bargains and get around that is, is what I'm getting at. That it's so inefficient for one group of people to own the bodies of a different group of people. Like people, there's such a natural desire to own your own body that whatever the property titles were originally, they would be rearranged, especially over generations to be in the hands of the, you know, the individuals themselves. And I'm saying what prevented that as an economist. I'm saying clearly there must've been government interventions all over the place to keep that more natural outcome from occurring. So I don't know if you want to, by the way, are you okay if we just go a little bit over the, sure. the top? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Just to wrap. So anyway, do you, do you have any response to that reaction? No, that's a great point. I, I hadn't really thought about that, but yeah, I mean, that it's just, as you say, it's like, it's so inefficient. You've had, you got to have regulations of it just every step of the way to try to get some net benefit to the slaveholders Otherwise, I mean, the pressures of uh, of the free market just it, slavery just can't stand up to um, that that free competition, and that's what that's what Mises says. He goes, "Look, it's not that everybody all of a sudden just decided in the West to play nice." He said basically that the pressures of free market competition and the the opportunities from that were demonstrably better than slavery. And so, mm. um, but yeah, that's, they did have ways of, you know, people saving up and, you know, trying to, uh, buy their way out of slavery, some of which happened. And, you know, there were things, um, difficulties they had, uh, after that because they weren't, uh, weren't citizens, but, uh, still it, it was, um, ultimately, you know, <laughs> like you said, there, there has to be government involvement and regulations every step of the way. Otherwise, it's so inefficient. You don't really get, um, there's hardly any benefit to be seen from it. Yeah, and I, I didn't see it in your article here, but I know I've also read that there were rules, at least in some states, like you couldn't teach your slaves how to read and write and, and things like that, which, you know, clearly if you're a property owner, things you could do that would boost the productivity of your property, you would want to do. Right. And so if there's, you know, if there's rules against, oh, no, you can't teach your, obviously what they, they wanted to make it so it was harder for them to get together and, and you know, have a revolution right. and whatnot. So it's clearly the local government uh, doing something that was against the direct financial interests of the particular property owners for, quote, you know, the general welfare. And so, right. again, and the very spirit of regulation interventions into the market economy. So, again, just another example showing, yep, that's why government intervention propped up slavery. Well, and that's Mises has a section on that where he says, look, if you're going to want unskilled worker, like to the level of like what you'd have, like an animal, like a horse or a draft mule or an ox, you can force people to do that. But to the extent that you want them to do anything that's more skilled, now you're wanting training other things. You're, you're almost like slavery, the, the forcing them to, to work is just going to kind of uh, evaporate, you know, because there's no, um, 
because the more you train them to be productive, uh, the fewer gains you're going to get from the enforcement of mm -hmm. uh, of slavery, unless you're just trying to force someone to work like a draft animal. But then you could also just use a draft animal. It doesn't right. Matter. And yeah, I know which passage you're talking about, as Mises points out there, that the partly the difference, though, is that humans aren't as strong as an ox, right? <laughs> <laughs> so if you really are just trying to do it. And on the flip side, you can't teach an ox calculus, you know, no matter what you do or, or just say here, you know, I want you to, attitude. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I want you to, uh, uh, you know, here, we're going to have you be the vice president in charge of uh, manufacturing. And so go ahead and, you know, it, like that just, that doesn't work. It doesn't matter what the incentive structure, horses and, you know, mules can't do that. Whereas humans obviously can do that. Right. And so again, just, just underscoring when you say, well, gee, how come the slaves didn't just buy their freedom? Well, well partly it's because in some places there were laws against, the slaves being educated, you know, even if the owner would want it that. And this also harkens back to, I think, Josh, too, some of the things when you read about like antiquity and like, oh, and so and so slave, you know, went to Greece and did business on behalf of his master. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, that seems like a pretty response. And I think that's because the word slave, like in certain cultures to it, it'd be more like an indentured servant or something in right. our terminology. So anyway, just to show the, the variations of slavery throughout history. And again, why it usually just faded away over time as the institutions evolved as opposed to in the U.S., why was it that they needed this bloody war to, quote, you know, free the slaves? Okay, um, last thing here in your article, the last one you cover is constitutional slave trade subsidy. Uh, and you said it was in the Constitution itself in the slave trade clause, Article 1, Section 9, do you want to just speak to that briefly? Sure. Yeah, so this was a the brief section of my article, but basically um, there were ideas to close the slave trade, which actually most of the states were in favor of, uh, and in fact, they, they did it on their own. Um, but northern states tended to benefit more from the trade of slaves rather than the actual um, usage of slaves, where the south was more generally anti-slave trade, but uh, in favor of the institution of slavery. But the Constitution had a compromise in there that in Article 1, Section 9, that said the importation of persons, it never uses the word slave, but that's what it's talking about, cannot be closed until the year, um, it was either 1807 or 1808, I think it's 1808 because of the, it's after it's ratified. Um, so what this the, the Constitution is saying is as far as the federal government is concerned, it will not be allowed to put in legislation that says we're going to do what England did and end the slave trade. Um, and so what that was for is to keep the uh, the companies involved in the slave trade um, going for a while at that point. Um, to uh, to benefit them. So when you have the federal government say, hey, we're keeping this thing open for 20 years and then we'll allow legislation to close it, well, then that means it's largely, as far as they're concerned, going to be closed. Uh, it's going to continue to exist longer than it otherwise would. Thankfully, all the states minus South Carolina uh, did put in legislation to uh, to end the slave trade uh, prior to that. Um, but it is, you know, noteworthy that that happened. Now, Thomas Jefferson and his presidency and the Congress at that time, they did close the slave trade uh, in 1807 and 1808 in the United States. Unfortunately, while that was a good thing to do, it allowed for the price of existing slaves in America to go up and uh, Unfortunately, there was a, a domestic slave trade, but that was also an industry protected, again, by the state, um, by the, the governments uh, involved that um, could not have had uh, the success that it did without state regulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here, let me ju just try to take this to the, make this more meta. I can understand, so so thank you, and I clearly understand the, the points you're making there, but I could see in fairness to, to, you know, a 16, 19 project kind of person trying to argue, right, that's what, see, what we're saying is that, um, 
if the federal government merely refrains from interfering with the slave trade, then it will prosper. And so that, you know, it's for the for that clause in the Constitution to say the federal government will not meddle with the slave trade and try to interfere with the transatlantic trade, that's the government staying out of the way of business, right? And that's our point. No, we need to go in and stamp it out. Sure. So anyway, I'm just, so I get what you're saying. And, and with some of the stuff, it gets a little bit tricky because given that the government is in charge of legal contract enforcement and like the delineation of property titles, you know, what, what would it mean to say it's going to remain neutral on slavery? Cause you know, if to say, Oh, that human being is my property in that context back then, you know, that involved right. the government weighing in on it. But again, so I don't know if you see what I'm saying, John, to me, oh, I do. Yeah. Yeah the, I, the man, I think- the, yeah. the prohibition on manumission stuff is more clearly showing there sure. the government, even if, you say, hey, we're agnostic as to whether humans can be titles, property titles or not. You know, they're, they're clearly interfering with property rights. The government. It, well, it, th- that's a great point. I think it's like, oh, well, the government was, see, the government was libertarian and look what happened. Um, but that's what I'm, it, the fact that it made a policy um, restricting itself from making it any type of, you know, uh, movement toward ending slavery is kind of the main point. They didn't just say, we're going to stay out of this. Hey, close the slave trade, open the slave trade. What they said is this government cannot close the slave trade. Right. It would be kind of like now if uh, if there was a constitutional provision somehow in 2024 that said, we cannot make any laws regarding the border of the United States for 20 years. And you know, whatever happens from there happens. Well, that handcuffs, you know, any type of um, actions or things going forward uh, from there on for 20 years. So it's not just, hey, we're staying out of it um, and it's laissez-faire. It's that we're saying we can't, there there will be no uh, decision made either way on this, uh, on this issue um, for the next 20 years. So um, so anyway, I mean, there could, I, I think in this case, you know, a government closing of, uh, the slave trade, uh, would have been just and, and legitimate. Uh, that being said, it's, uh, I think this is far from a kind of hands-off, uh, libertarian approach to slavery. Yeah. I mean, th- again, just to make sure people are getting this, the reason this is kind of a, a subtle, awkward topic is that like, if the federal government said, you know, we, for the next 20 years, will make no laws uh, regulating the importation of heroin. You could see from a libertarian point of view, like, oh yeah, that's great. They're not meddling with business and they're at least giving us a 20 year window when they're not going to meddle. But the difference here is, or one difference is to say, we're not going to interfere with the slave trade is themselves agreeing that some human beings can own other human beings. And so if that itself really is a crime, according to standard you know, libertarian theory, then that is the federal government coming down, like you say, and saying, at least for the next 20 years, we are going to mess with the, you know, actual natural enforcement of just property titles. Right. That, you know, so just like it'd be if they just said, you know, for the next 20 years, we're not going to regulate if if there are pirates that are kidnapping people off ships, we're not going to mess with that. And that would as obviously be a, you know, pro-free market move as to say, right. we're not going to regulate. Yeah, we're them. not going to punish yeah. human trafficking for the next 20 right. years. right. But so, hey, we haven't made a policy. <laughs> yeah. So th- anyway, that's in human trafficking. You know, that's one way of thinking. What was slavery, right? So yeah, literally. Okay. So um, all right. So that that's good. So maybe now, just stepping back here, let's if we just call it another five minutes or so, Josh. Sure. Uh, can what are you say? Wh- what are you saying then? So okay. So yeah, it didn't take the civil. Wh- what are you talking about? Are are you saying that had it not been for these things, slavery would have melted away by what nineteen forty? Like what, what, what are you saying? Or would it have taken the federal government to buy out the slaves? Like I know they did in some other countries, like that was the way mm-hmm. they did it is they just like the taxpayer effectively paid off the, you know, compensated the slaveholders and then gave ownership to the slaves is like legally, I think how it happened. Yeah. My point is more so I, I don't make any uh, predictions and counterfactual history. I try to be an honest historian and, you know, not try to say that. I, uh, what I am trying to say is that um, be honest about the history and the economics, but also part of that honesty involves seeing that uh, freedom and voluntary cooperation uh, 
um, and the laws of economics actually do put negative costs and pressures against slavery and kind of changing the the narrative that we're familiar with that, well, you know, if it wasn't for big government and, and good old Abraham Lincoln, um, we we would still have slavery. I can't predict, you know, counterfactual history, but I'm saying, well, wait a second. The governments involved, the federal, state, and local governments had all these years of enforcing slavery and putting the costs onto non-slaveholders, that's not the free market. Slavery uh, was a, is a deadweight loss overall to, uh, to all people. So I guess the message that I want to take away from it is that, uh, yeah, freedom, uh, voluntary cooperation uh, works. And when you do it that way, um, you reap net benefits. When we don't, there are costs, but the costs don't get felt when the government comes in and socializes them onto, uh, onto other people. I think that's an injustice, uh, as well. So I, I guess if that, I ho hopefully that summarizes kind of what, what I'm wanting people to take away is just kind of a different perspective on, I don't know when slavery would have come to an end had, uh, had these laws, uh, not been in place, but uh, I can tell you this: these laws were in place to um, uh, enforce slavery and socialize the costs onto others. So slavery literally could not have had uh, the extent that it did without them. Right, and again, for for people who think we're making just armchair theor theoretical points, the the historical record does show that slavery was ubiquitous throughout history and around the world. And I, what, was there like a violent revolt in Haiti? I, isn't it like just like yeah. it's like the U.S. and I think Haiti was where there was two places went, where it ended violently, right. or U.S. and Haiti. Everywhere else, it was handled peacefully. Yep. So again, just to show that that we're not you know being dogmatic that no, actually these the U.S. and Haiti were the historical exceptions to the rule that slavery would have died out of its own accord and inefficiencies as as, as society progressed. Okay, well, my guest this week has been Joshua Mahorder, who is, among other things, an assistant editor at Mises.org. Uh, Joshua, thanks so much for your time and your insights. Yeah, thank you for having me, Dr. Murphy. It's been a great time. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org. Mises.org.